Travis Thomas has three words for you on this episode of Unbeatable that will change your life. And I am not exaggerating when I say, if you will just hear these three words, understand what these three words represent, it really can change your life. You see, this guy came from small town America that really went through it in Flint, Michigan. And then he experienced a couple of really challenging moments personally in his finances and in his family. And in the process, he learned a couple of things about handling challenges, about facing reality. Let's just call it, he figured out how to be unbeatable. And he teaches people how to, here's the three words, live, yes, and. I promise you, you are going to be challenged. You're going to be fired up after you hear from my guest, Travis Thomas, on this episode of Unbeatable. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Travis, thank you for being my guest on this episode of Unbeatable. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, And it's an honor. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been doing a little bit of research. I've kind of been cyber stalking you to figure out who you are. And because you're a comedian, we're going to have some fun. We're going to have some laughs on this episode, man. I hope so. I hope so. Yes. Yeah, but but you're an improv guy, so you're going to have to basically carry the whole thing if we're going to have Great. any fun, if we're going to have any Great. laughs. No pressure, yes. all right? Yes, and. All right, let's do this. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, we're going to get into how you stepped into the world of standing on stage, doing a little bit of stand-up, and actually getting into improv, which is very, very different for you. Um, yeah. But I want to go back to early. Um, I want people to hear a little bit about, uh, you know, you coming from the heartbeat of America, coming from Flint, Michigan. And I'd like to for you yeah. to just tell folks what life was like as a kid. But I cannot um, we cannot pass over. You got to describe a little bit for the audience what it was like at Halo Burgers with dad and granddad, wow. you know, running yes. the restaurant. So let's hear it, man. But Jeff, you you stalked me well. I, well heck done. Yeah, I did. Well done. Yes. So um, yeah. So Flint, Michigan, uh, born and raised. Um, I always tell people like I, may, I. So I live in St. Louis now, but I say I, I live in St. Louis, but I'm I'm Flint with pride, right? I will always Flint be. Flint with pride. You know, you can take the kid out of Flint, but you can't take the Flint out of the kid. And um, uh, and you can't yeah. take the water out of the out of Flint at all. Right no, now. you don't want to. You don't want to. Yes, Flint, whether it's the water crisis or whether it's General Motors, Uh it is when you think of Midwestern town of people that like just endure and uh, are tough, resilient people. I don't think I'm one of them, but but Flint sort of represents (laughs) that. And so, yeah, yeah, I grew up. So I grew up in Flint in the 80s when, you know, General Motors was sort of at its peak. But then it started, you know moving plants to other parts of the country, other parts uh-huh. of the world. And all of a sudden this, this, this thriving town that was so dependent on one industry really kind of went through it. And, uh, yeah. uh, my grandfather, my grandfather started a hamburger business, you know, back in the, uh, the sixties called Halo Burger. Um, my dad took it over right when I was born because my, my grandfather passed away pretty suddenly. And so, oh, really? you know, here I am as a, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm a kid in, in Flint and I'm growing up. And, you know, I think maybe my dad had 10, 10 restaurants kind of in the, the Flint, mid Michigan. Oh, area he was a, bit, he was a franchisee. Yeah. Well, was it, it wasn't a franchise. It was just, they were just cell phones. Right. Really? And so, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. People kind of approached him to franchise them at different times, so, but they weren't franchise. And, and so most of my life, right. My childhood was being at the store, um, right. you know, getting, getting to know the employees. Eating a lot of hamburgers I and fries. I can only imagine. Soda, way, way more than any other, than any child should ever consider. <laughs> way more than what's healthy uh, for just you. Just way more, which is why I've been a vegetarian for over 10 years now, Jeff. Because um, <laughs> I hate low the first, the first 35 years of my life. Um, and so, but for a kid, it was great. And um, everyone loved their Halo burger. Right in the mid Michigan area, and so like, yeah, I'm the Halo Burger kid. <laughs> uh, but it was great. It was Flint was Flint produced cars, hamburgers, and professional athletes, and um, uh, sports were a big part of my life. And yeah. there was just and Flint, Flint was a great town to grow up and love sports, play sports, and um, but I think really that experience of 
growing up in a family business. Right. And for me, it was less, less about the business and seeing the impact that a business can have on the community and seeing the impact a business can have with the employees internally. I look at, you know, kind of how my, my career trajectory has gone and it, it didn't always make sense to me, but I, there, there was, there's so many seeds from my childhood experience of being in my dad's stores and seeing how tough other people's lives were um, that left kind of an indelible mark on me as a child. And I think it still shows up today. Yeah. I was thinking for our listeners that are around the world, they don't really understand Flint, Michigan, but back in the eighties, it was a really important city in America, but not a huge city. And yeah. the auto industry yeah. dominated and then it just occurred to me, if yeah. you're a kid and dad has 10 hamburger stores in, in Flint and the surrounding area, and then Flint glow, goes through it, well, your father's business goes through it, your family's going through it. You may not notice how bad it is, yeah. but it's all around you every day. And man, that must have yeah. been, it must have left a mark or two on you. It did, you know, I think um, I, I chalk up, I was kind of a flighty kid. And uh -huh. so um, I think a lot of it probably, I, I was probably in denial. A lot of it probably went over my head or I always just focused on other things. You know, I think my dad probably did a, you know, a, a good job of kind of hiding probably how dire it was on occasion. And um, we were able to weather really the, the, the worst part of the storm. You know, I, I think right. it was, you know, once, Je so for those who are listening, right, General Motors, was the city of Flint. And so when they yeah, start closing plants, every industry, every business is dependent. Sure. I was going to say at this point, it's one of the biggest organizations, biggest companies in the world in Flint, yeah. Michigan, yeah. Uh, you know, there in Flint. So yeah. this is huge. So, so in Michigan, yeah. So in Michigan, Detroit was the biggest city. Flint was number two. And, and I think on that top 10 list now, it's, it's barely even the top 10. Flint, <laughs> right. right. It's just a small, small town. And so in the span of a couple of years, Flint turned into a ghost town in certain uh -huh. neighborhoods. And so, um, and, and, and to be able to kind of, you know, I think we had maybe 15 stores. He had 14, 15 stores at one point, and we wow. had to go down to like nine, which, yeah. um, and yeah, it was, it was just a really, really tumultuous time. Um, and, but we were able to, we were able to weather it. And he actually might, you know, we, we kept it in the family till about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago. My dad finally sold the business uh, about 11 years ago. But just to just to show how what a difficult business it is, Jeff, it's the uh, it's been sold, I think, two or three times since wow. my dad sold it 11 years ago. Yeah. And so, you know, the uh, the food service industry is a really, really difficult oh, yeah. industry to be in. Uh, and so it was it was. Um, but it was for me, again, it was it, it represents so much of, of, of what shaped me. Well, the food service industry, like retail and a couple of other industries, have been through the ringer in the last few years. But when you're going, yeah. when you're in a town like Flint that's been through the ringers for about 30 years and you're in an industry that's so competitive yeah. and so uh, impacted by the local economy, that that's that's a rough way to to, you know, make a living there. And your father is employing a lot of people and helping a lot of people, you know, feed their family by giving them a great yeah. job as long as he can keep them, you know, keep the stores open. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, you know, we were always seen as, as the, as the business that tried to run the business like a family, right? When you have yeah. you know, the, you know, a number of stores and things like that, it, it's really hard to be a family, but you know, my dad is someone who really believed in loyalty and, and, and trying to take care of people, you know, extremely loyal, extremely generous, you know, man. And he ran the business that way. And sometimes, right, he got taken advantage of as a result and uh, made some bad decisions along yeah. the way. But I think his heart, his heart was always in the right place. And, and, and people, you know, people uh, appreciated that. So um, to run a business, to run a difficult business, but to try to do it with a sense of, you know, care and compassion um, is really difficult. But it, but that's, that's, you know, that's the way that, that he tried to run. So, you know, and so I got to see that, you know, I got to see, obviously there's lots of different ways to, um, to do things, but that, that yeah. definitely made an impact on me growing up. And so as I've gotten older and, you know, I, you know, I still have family in that area, um, but haven't lived there in a long time. Um, when I, when I think about, when I think about business and when I think about career and I think about how to do things, um, you know, I'm not a very cutthroat person. 
<laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I'm a very loyal person and I, I, be- right. I believe in, you know, being a, being a good person first and, um, you know, and trying to have in, in integrity and generosity and, um, and, and really trying to sort of tap into the, the goodness. of Yeah. Okay, so let's go from Halo Burgers to the most mediocre, mediocre athlete on the planet. Let's talk about you leaving home, going to school, playing some sports. Well, you got that right. You got that yeah. right. I'm quoting you, by the way. I didn't come up with this. You know, this isn't me pulling up your stats. This is your own words. It wouldn't take you long to pull up my college stats, Jeff. Um, one career college goal. There you go. Um, All right. So, uh, uh, but. I, but I did play for four years. Yeah. So I, I went to a division three college in um, uh, right outside of St. Louis in Illinois called Principia College um, and played there for four years. Played, by the way, tell everybody what you played. There. Soccer. Sorry, I played uh-huh. soccer. Soccer was my passion. Okay. I played a lot of sports growing up in Flint and soccer was my passion. So I, I played soccer there um, and I'm glad I stuck it out, but it was a difficult experience. Um, but uh, but it taught me so much, right? Going through you know, <laughs> I know this, you know, unbeatable. Going through difficult experiences yeah. teach you a lot. Right. Uh, they're not usually fun when you're going through them. Okay. But if you allow yourself to be, if you allow yourself to, to be impacted and to be transformed, you know, how you are transformed is always better on the other side. And I look at those four years of struggle, you know, just as an athlete trying to find right. his groove, trying to be successful and never getting there. So I see that struggle. But I also see everything that it forced me to learn as a result. And even if some of those lessons were slow, and if even if some of those lessons really didn't take, you know, place, uh, they didn't really hit until probably maybe a few years outside uh-huh. of school that I was like, oh, yes, that's that's what was going on. That's what I needed to do. That's what I learned from that. Um, but, you know, but I but I stuck with it. You know, I, I ended up graduating going back home to Flint and uh, immediately becoming the assistant coach at, uh, at my high school uh, that I went to for three years and just loved it. Loved being huh. able to create yeah. relationships with those players. And it was just like, man, if I could do work that recreates this feeling moving forward, I would be interested in that. But at the time, I didn't know what that was. And so, you know, uh, my wife and I got married right out of school. Um, and then from there, the next couple of years, it sort of became really trying to get a sense of, of what is it that, that, that I really wanted to do. So we ended up kind of bouncing around from Michigan to St. Louis to, to Boston. And, and, um, and, and that's, where, that's where I ultimately ended up finding improvisation. There's a period, um, we, we talked about it just before we started recording today, where you were stuck in the goo. Um, and I'd love for you to kind of explain what that felt like for you, what was going on in your family and in your finances, because there's some people listening right now all over the world that are stuck in the glue, in the goo, and they're not sure what to do next. They're not sure how to find their way out of it. So can you describe 2009 and being air quotes stuck in the goo for everybody who's driving and not watching this on YouTube right now? <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, stuck in, stuck in the goo. It, it's, um, it is a chapter in my book, Jeff, and it's funny, uh, you know, what the, it's the chapter that I get the most feedback from, from people when they read the book. They're like, the goo chapter. Thank you for the goo chapter. And mm-hmm. so uh, the goo for me in 2009 was, you know, I got into improvisation when I was in Boston, late 90s. Started, you know, got trained, started performing, did, did the professional performer in Boston for years, moved to Florida, had a family, three young kids. Um started a group in Florida, but it was more of a glorified hobby. It wasn't a career. And this is when I kind of like, I wanted to tap back into that feeling that I had, you know, coaching and working with people, right? being part of a team. And I knew I wanted to, you know, spirituality was always very important to me growing up. Um, mm-hmm. uh, philosophy, psychology really struck my, stoked my interest. And of course, sports and now improvisation, all these ideas, you know, it was like an amorphism, of, I, I feel like there's a connection between all of them, but what's that look like? And I want to dive into right. it. So I ended up doing my own dive into personal development. I wanted to become a coach and an executive coach and a life coach and a performance coach. And a, but, you know, like I don't really have any experience. And so after a couple of years of floundering and losing money and going into debt and having three young kids and I was desperate 
uh-huh. and we couldn't afford to li- live in our house anymore in Florida. Um, and this is the real estate bust, you know, in the uh, oh, yeah. 2000s. And, uh-huh. and it was like a, a buddy of mine threw me a lifeline uh, who I played soccer with. And he was the, the college coach now at my alma mater. And he's like, hey, mm-hmm. I need an assistant coach for the season. And I moved the family up there hoping that uh, a part-time job turned into a full-time. And it didn't. I had a great season, loved it. But after that season ended, there was nothing. Well, wait a second. I got to pause you for just a second to make sure I hear what's going on. So you had dreams of making it big. I'm living in Florida. I got some plans in place. And then those dreams come crashing in around you. And you go back to your alma mater for an assistant coaching job that's part time. And there's no way that's going to feed a family of five, right? That's where we're at right now. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but my faith was, my faith was, yeah, thank you for putting it in context. And so, um, yeah, the season ends and I was like, now what? I thought there would be some full-time opportunities and there weren't. And, um, uh, another friend of mine threw me another lifeline, but it was a smaller lifeline. <laughs> he said, Hey, um, he was the, he was the athletic director at, at, at a high school here in St. Louis. And he said, Hey, the JV basketball coach needs an assistant. JV, the JV wow. basketball coach needs JV an assistant coach. basketball said, assistant coach. Put that on your resume. Assistant. Wow. Yes. And I said, I don't play basketball. And he's like, <laughs> just be the character guy. Just be the character guy. And I'm like, all right. The, I mean, I had no other options, right? And so right. here I am, fam- you know, family of five. You know, I'm in my what mid thirties, uh, mid thirties. Um, uh, we're in debt. And I know that over the next three months, I'm probably going to make around 2,500. Oh man. Right. Trying to take, trying to take care of my family. And, um, and that's all I have going. Right. That's all I have going. And I remember, cause I'm back in St. Louis now. We're recently back in St. Louis. And I remember mm-hmm. driving around. I can still remember the road and just driving and just not having no idea, no earthly idea, Jeff, how this like, where was this path going? And I remember driving and just feeling like a huge failure. You know, just individually, I felt like a failure. As a husband, I felt like a failure. As a father, I felt like a failure. And just like, you know, all right, God, like, I got nothing. Right. Like, I've got no idea. How is this going to work out? And what do you, kind of, what do you want me to do? Right? I will. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm listening, praying. Listen, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. And I always laugh, Jeff, like, no, like there, there was no like, uh, you know, uh, lifeline that was thrown to me that was like mm-hmm. having to sell my soul to the devil just to make right. a quick buck. Thank God they didn't because I probably would have taken it, <laughs> but that wasn't thrown at me. So I had to stay on the path that felt genuine and purposeful to what I was trying to do, which was keep doing what you're doing, even if you don't see a wow. way out. Yeah. And, and that's and, and that's what I was. And so this idea of the goo, Jeff, actually comes from the caterpillar, right? The caterpillar that transforms into a butterfly. Yeah. Right? So okay. if you know the story, like mm-hmm. most of us, most of us do, you know, the caterpillar is born. It goes through its life, you know, eating and shedding skin, eating and shedding skin, molts. And then finally, it kind of gets to the point where it's no longer shedding skin. Its body is creating a coffin, a tomb around mm-hmm. it, right so just imagine i always go what was the cat what's the caterpillar thinking like oh we had a right. good run this is it right like my yeah. body is literally it's it's transforming into my tomb and this is what i never understood jeff is inside the cocoon i always assumed that the caterpillar maybe dropped off some pieces grew a few pieces and kind uh-huh. of like that's what the transformation looked like and it's not Right. What happens inside the cocoon is that the entire physical form of the caterpillar turns into a blackish brownish goo. It completely wow. gooifies. So the ca- the caterpillar is no longer a caterpillar. It's just sticky brownish black goo. But here's the cool thing. Here's where the science gets involved. Science says that the goo is rich with nutrients and potential. The goo is rich with nutrients and potential. And actually, the caterpillar has been carrying in its DNA the entire time imaginal cells. They're called imaginal cells, which will kick in 
once it's in its goose state, which allows it to transform into the butterfly. And so from, from the goo, this beautiful new physical form is created and then it slowly cracks out of its old shell and flies. It doesn't devolve, it evolves into a caterpillar that probably spent its entire life on one branch. Its new form breaks away from its cocoon and can now fly. Like that's transformation. And so we go back to how is the transformation possible? Yeah. The transformation is not possible without the goo. The goo is where the transformation is. And so how often do we embrace the goo that we're going through? Yeah. You're talking to some people right now because they're feeling like a failure. Um, and by the way, I didn't realize mm-hmm. that you were a caterpillarologist. I know that's not a word, but you just made a word up and said gooifies. So I'm going to make words up in this one too. It's improv. I give um, you permission. But man, you're talking to a lot of people right now. A mom who feels like a failure because she doesn't know what she's doing and the kids are not you know, responding the way they're supposed to. Or the guy who is giving it everything at work, but it's not getting any better. It's just getting worse. And they're all looking for the exit and they're thinking, how do I get out of this? How do I change it? How do I make stuff better? And it's hard. What I'm, man, as you're talking, I'm thinking it is hard to stay in the goo. It's easy to want to get out of the goo, but beautiful stuff can happen in the goo if you'll stay in the goo. Man, you're talking to me right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a helpful analogy because it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful analogy because the actual going through it is so darn. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, and it's, it's, it's helped me get through other goo. And if, you know, it, it's, you know, I'll catch myself, you know, so often when we're going through those goo experiences, Jeff, all we keep asking ourselves is when is this going to be over? Right. When right. is this going to be over? Yeah. When is this going to be over? And if we can catch ourselves and actually shift it to, wow, imagine how I'm being Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine how much better, stronger, wiser, more resilient. Um, because here's the thing. We don't, no one accomplishes anything if they haven't gone through endless goo experience. Oh, absolutely. It's the, o- it's the only way. It's the only way. Because, because the easy path doesn't create any strength. Right. There's no courage. There's mm-hmm. no courage in the easy path. Right. What is required for courage? Fear is required for courage. Right. Like when people are like, I just want to be fearless. I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> why do you want to be fearless? Right. Right. If you're doing something and you're fearless, you're not growing from it. It's called right. comfort. Right. Courage. Courage is the it, fear is a necessity. Uh huh. And, and, and why do, why do we, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to one right now. Why do we look up to people who are courageous? Yeah. Because it's the ability to do what needs to be done, even in the face. Of and that's what yeah. the goo is. I'm, I'm telling right? you, it's, it's, there's somebody who's listening to this podcast while they're on the way to the gym. They're doing chores at the house. They're driving right now. And they're like, man, I am right in the middle of it. And you're talking to them right where yeah. they're at right now, Travis. Yeah. And, and, and so whoever that is that's listening right now, remember the goo is good. Right. The goo is good. Right. What you're experiencing is not easy, but the goo is good. And it's not about Jeff. It's not about knowing what the transformation is going to look like. It's, it's surrendering to the transformation and trusting that the transformation is going to be better. Right. Right. The butterfly, the, 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 the caterpillar never transforms into a less evolved idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> it always, it's always yeah. propelled, it's always propelled forward, propelled forward. And so, you know, another good friend of mine always uses the analogy of, you know, how are bonds created in welding, right? A bond is created through heat and pressure, right? You need the heat and you need the pressure, right? To create a unbreakable bond. If you don't have heat, 
or you don't have pressure, you don't have a bond. It's, it's too flimsy. It's, it hasn't, it hasn't gone through that goo, which is required to create that. Structure. Yeah. What, you know, whether that it's a, is a house built, saying. whether it's a house built on sand or, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> right. Um, it, it, it it, it has to be built. It has to be built on strength. And strength yeah. cannot, strength cannot come artificial. What that friend is saying is exactly what this podcast stands for, man. When you're facing the heat, when you're facing the pressure, the people that are really unbeatable don't run from it. They actually get stronger in the middle of it. But I just, every episode, we say the same thing. It ain't easy, man. All of us feel the desire to run and to quit and Running and quitting will never become a beautiful butterfly. Running and quitting leaves the process before it's over with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey. And, and again, uh, the, the thing that I try to give permission, you know, to people, Jeff, is, is that the permission for it to be difficult. Right. right? It, it, it's okay if it's difficult. It's okay if you're scared. It's okay if you're nervous. It's okay if you're afraid. It's okay if you're frustrated. Like that is all normal. But please keep going. Yeah. Hey, Travis, we have a sponsor. Um, it's Go Ministries. And these guys and gals, they just help pour into people, invest in them, develop them a little bit. And then the ultimate goal is to deploy them to make a huge difference around the world. And they recognize it's not going to be easy, but we're going to deploy you anyway. I want you to hold on for just a second, because after this commercial spot, we're going to come back and talk about what it looks like to really face fear. And I'm talking about one of the greatest fears of every human being on the planet. You have done it repeatedly. So let's hear from Go Ministries. And then after that, we're going to talk about the fear of public speaking. Hi, my name is Will Parton. I'm the president of Go Ministries. Go Ministries empowers local leaders to make disciples. Over the past 30 years, I've seen our ministry go from one family, one church, and one school to over 300 local leaders making disciples in 150 different communities through church planting, sports, and medical. And we're getting ready to expand into other countries. The way that we define a disciple-making culture is when mentorship, mission, and multiplication are present. When there's that one-on-one -on -one mentorship between two people that are sharing the gospel, we believe that discipleship is taking place. And then when a group of people are gathering together and they're on mission together, serving their community that surrounds them, that's another part of discipleship. And then lastly, you can't be a disciple or disciple-maker if multiplication isn't the final goal. So would you please join us in our disciple making movement and our disciple making culture by going to gomen.org. There are people, I have been around some of the most courageous people on the planet, literally the guys and gals in the military, not just the US military, but around the world. But almost every expert says the number one human fear is not getting shot at on a battlefield. It's actually public speaking. I mean, the statistics say most people would rather die on the battlefield than stand up in front of a microphone and speak in public. And you made this insane decision to go trans, uh, to leave kind of your coaching world. You, you actually do that still a little bit, but to go into the arena of comedy, improv comedy, which is about as hard as it gets and public speaking. And I just got to know, what did this feel like the first night you were on stage with a microphone and the light shining on your face, staring at a crowd before the first words came out of your mouth? Because most people would wet their pants in a situation like that. <laughs> uh, yes. You know, you are not going to catch me on a battlefield. So I, you know, failing in front and of a group of strangers, you are not going to catch me on a any, comedy any stage. Day. Uh, you know, the, the feeling, you know, just to kind of tie some things together, right? Standing on a, a stage and doing an improvisation felt the closest thing to sports. To be able to uh, do something that had stakes involved yeah. uh, and that it was so that, that the excitement, the butterflies in the stomach of improvising, it felt like playing sports. And what I love about improvisation compared to just stand-up comedy, I love stand-up comedy, but stand-up comedy is writing out a routine ahead uh -huh. of time, standing up on stage and delivering it. And there is an art and there's a craft to that, and I love it. Improvisational comedy is standing on stage, 
with one or more other people and you're trusting that group of people that you're going to create something funny and entertaining together without a script, without a script. And so the thing that, that struck me when I took my very first class, Jeff, the thing that struck me right away was, oh, this is a collaborative experience. Yeah. And I can't control it. Right. I cannot control it. And so, you know, there's there's a as I got into improvisation, it kept just pointing at, oh, wow, this is totally applicable to my corporate work. Or, oh, this uh -huh. is applicable to my marriage. And this totally needed to be shared um, with my sports teams. And I, I these light bulbs were going off of how applicable the principles of improvisation were to the real world. And but I at that time, I was just focused on being a performer, right? Training yeah. and, and, and going through that school and then being able to audition and become a performer. And now I'm doing shows, you know, two, three, four shows a weekend and just loving it. And then teaching in the training center and do a corporate training and all that stuff. And so if you fast forward years later, as I got into the coaching world again, as a, as a performance coach and executive coach and life coach and back into working with athletes as a performance coach, what I realized was so many of those ideas from improvisation mm -hmm. were, were applicable to performance in their world, whatever that world would be. So how could I share some of those concepts in a way that was, that was uh, unique, interactive, mm -hmm. and, but relevant, like powerfully relevant. And so, and so that was sort of kind of the brand that I, that I've created with my coaching is, is, is tying into the improv world. Because here's the thing, all life, Jeff, is an improvisation. And All that's right. the re that's the reality, right? Life is an improvisation. Yeah, you're for, just taking for, it as it comes. For any of us who are listening right now to think that you know what is going to happen is ridiculous. Right. Right? We assume we have predictions, assumptions and hey, uh, you know, most likely my work day will end at 5 today and then I have to go pick up my kids and after and then my son has training tonight and okay, so that's like if things go as planned, mm -hmm. here's what my day looks like. Well, how much of life goes as planned? All right. Right? How many of us expected a pandemic to be dropped in our lap? Were we right. all ready for that? Did we embrace it when it happened? <laughs> <laughs> so how were we forced to adapt and respond when life drops a curveball in your lap? And so that's all improvisation is, yeah. is constantly embracing the curveball and actually collaborating with the curveball. Right. So the basis of improvisation is the, is the, is the yes and, right? So I called my company live yes and because it's like, yeah, all, all you have to do huh. is just live this, 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 the, the foundation of right. improvisation, which is yes and. And here's what yes and means. And I think this is a great, if we tie it back to the goo, Jeff. Yeah. So, you know, again, just to use the pandemic, right? So all of a sudden we're going through life and the world shuts down, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a public speaker and a coach. My livelihood is built on travel and going and speaking in person. Just like that, it's done, right? So in improvisation, whatever is given to you as an idea, you say yes to it, right? So if you and I are doing a scene together, Jeff, and someone says, um, and we say, we need a suggestion to start the scene, and someone yells out, um, pickles. We're like, all right, we will take, we will take pickles. And the lights drop and the lights come up and you and I look at each other. <coughs> we have no idea what the other person is thinking. Uh huh. And, and you say to me, all right, Pete, put that pickle costume on and get out there and dance for those kids. <laughs> all right. What I have to say is your partner is yes. Right. Yes is I don't know where you're going with this idea, but I accept it. Yes is acceptance, but I can't stop there. I have to and it. I actually have to add on to well, your information. So I might say, yes, and after I get done with this birthday party, this is the last time I'm getting this pickle <laughs> suit, right? So I took your That's idea, right. I made it, we're at a birthday party, and what do you have to do now? You just have to yes and my yeah. new idea back. And you're gonna say, well, yes and, the circus is coming to town and I set up an audition for you, <laughs> right? Yes, I and was say, thinking. Yes, and so here we go. Right. You started off with pickle suit, it went to birthday party, it went to circus. The only reason, the only way we got there is by saying yes and. So yes is acceptance of the idea. I accept it. I don't have to like it, but I have to accept it. 
the and <coughs> is giving an idea that builds off mm-hmm. of your idea. And then you, yes, and me. And it's we're telling a story together one idea at a time. Neither one of us is controlling the story. We're influencing the story based on how we respond. Travis, thank you for that, because I just got this beautiful mental image of you in a pickle costume dancing in front of a bunch of kids, and it was so awesome. Um, Hey, totally random question. Do you have a genius level IQ or what? No, probably the furthest thing from it. I have always told my (laughs) wife, comedians are very, very intelligent people, but the improv comedians, those guys and gals have to be genius because the ability to react and to respond intelligently on the fly like that, it blows my mind. Look, I prepare for days to stand up and behind a microphone. The ability to do that with zero preparation, well, not preparation, but with zero (laughs) idea of what's coming next, man, that blows me away. Well, that's very kind. And I would say very untrue, right? Because I would, (laughs) I I wouldn't be doing no one, just so you know, Jeff, no one has ever accused me of being a genius, right? And I think my wife is probably in the next room listening. I'm the first person. You can tell your wife that I think you're a genius to be able to pull off improv comedy. This is why it's so applicable to everybody, which is, you know, anybody can improvise as long as you can say yes and right so the pickle suit right that's how it happens on stage right mm-hmm. yes and yes and my partner knows that i'm going to say yes and right. and i and i know they're going to yes and me i'm going to yes and them we have worked out the relationship whatever so now we trust each other we respect each other mm-hmm. i've got their back they've got my back boom safety right i have your back yes and so all we're doing is we're collaborating with the new idea so if we just take that off the stage and we bring that into um, we bring that into, you know, I, I get, obviously I was using the the pandemic as an example, but I, I bring that to the listener. Who is maybe just got has received um, some health news. Right. That's not fa- that's not favorable. Right. And so what do we do when we receive news that scares us or disappoints us or that we don't like? Right. We tend to want to our immediate response. We want to say no. No, right. can't be can't be yeah, right. That's right. Can't be ha- can't be happening, or it shouldn't be happening to me. Um, it's not fair. Um, it's not my fault. You know, yada 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 yada. Right. It's that victim mindset of um, of denial, right? Which is totally totally normal. It makes you human, but not healthy. Totally normal, but not but not healthy. But not healthy because you cannot progress until you say yes. Yeah. Yes is acceptance, Jeff. Right? If I've received a, a difficult health, you know, news diagnosis, I don't have to like it, but I have to say yes. Okay. Yep. That's what I'm dealing with. Right? We cannot control 100% of what happens to us. Mm-hmm. And that can be really, really scary. Yeah. And we get to control 100% of how we respond. Yeah, there it is right there. That, Boom. People need to hear that, that one again. I need the, you to say that one more time. So we cannot control 100% of what happens to us. And we control 100% of how we respond. Mm-hmm. That is the power of our and is the response. We're not arguing with reality. Right. We accept it with the yes. This is, all right, this is my new reality. Yes. Do I have to like it? No. But do I have to accept it? Yes. And what am I going to do about it? Right. How am I going to respond to it? And so this is living yes and. Right. We are constantly being bombarded dozens, if not a hundred times a day of ideas, of information, of things that are being dropped in our lap. Some of them we like, some of them we don't. Regardless of whether we like it or not, we have to, we have to accept them and say, yeah, this is happening and what yeah. am I going to do about it? So when I'm really clear about who I am and what I'm about, right? What are my values, right? What are my, what's my purpose, my mission in life? What are my intentions? You know, how do I want to treat people? What's the impact I want to have on the people that I love? You know, how do I want to be 
remembered by people. I'm not talking about building statues, but I'm like, hey, if someone has an interaction with Travis, how do I want them to feel as a result? Or I'm really clear about how I want them to feel. So regardless of what's happening to me, I'm going to accept what's happening to me. How I respond is going to be based on accepting the reality and responding from the best version of myself that's true to me. And so that's my and response. Well, you're describing some of the brilliant, some of the best military minds in history. Um, those guys and gals, those brilliant strat, uh, uh, tacticianers, um, the guys and gals that are brilliant at strategy, they all basically practice the same philosophy. It actually was quoted, maybe the best quote I've ever heard, um, by Mike Tyson, the famous boxer who said, everybody goes into the ring with a plan. And then the plan goes out the window when you get punched in the face the first time. And the greatest military minds out there, they all have this Hey, I've got an idea. I also have an idea of what we're going to do. I've got an idea of what the enemy is going to do. But when the first bullets go over your head, that idea can totally go out the window. (laughs) And now I have two reactions. I can either sit around and complain and pout. This in your terminology is the no but person. Or I can be the yes and okay, I don't like it. It just happened. I don't have a choice because it just yeah. happened to me. How am I going to respond to it? And those are the most brilliant military minds on the planet. The people that don't try to dismiss reality, but they just take what's given to them and figure out a way to make it work. Absolutely. That's and, and, and that's it. And it's really, really difficult to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It's really difficult to have that level of resilience in the moment. And so when I, you know, when I work with people, when I work with athletes, work with organizations, you know, what we're trying to do is not be perfect, but can we respond more quickly? Right. Moving, can we create a culture, a mindset and a culture that allows us to respond more quickly so that we don't get stuck as long as we usually get stuck? Right. Yeah. Can we cut, you know, five minutes into 60 seconds? You know, can we, because we're human, so we're always going to get stuck, but let's like, so when we notice that we're making excuses or we're blaming or we're complaining, let's use those as red flags that allow us to notice it so that we can now shift away yeah. from it into our and response, right? I like to call living yes and like, so when you're demonstrating this yes and mindset is you are in radical collaboration with reality. Oh, I right. like this. I'm writing that down right now. <laughs> I don't have to like it, but that's what's happening. It's my new reality. So the best possible result is going to be if I actually collaborate with it instead of trying to deny it or ignore it. Yeah. And I've seen some of the best athletes out there, literally some of the most talented athletes on the planet that when the plan doesn't go the way they expect it to go, they just fall apart because they put all of this preparation, all of this training into a plan. And then you have some of these guys and gals that are really pretty good, but they're not the greatest athletes, but they're able to react. They're able to respond and they're able to do stuff that's just magnificent on the court, on the field, whatever, because they don't try to force a plan that's not happening anymore. They just react to what's been thrown at them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think oftentimes it is the outcome becomes the distraction. And so when things aren't going well, we get fixated on the outcome. And when we get fixated on the outcome, what it takes us away from is actually what is happening. And so that idea, right? So, you know, I'll tell you why I'm not a, why, why I'm not a genius. So the, the ability to do improvisation really well is actually taking the complex and making it. And so imp- improvisation done well, all I'm doing is I'm not, I don't have to think of about, I don't have to think of a lot of things. Uh huh. All I have to do is listen and respond to the new idea. That's it. And if I can shut out the rest of the distractions that are trying to make me feel nervous, that are trying to make me feel scared, that right. are trying to pull my attention away. That's just that's just the distractions in life that we're constantly being dealing with. But if we always are able to to make it small and to ask ourselves, all right, what can I do right now? 
right? Yeah. What is what can I do right now to respond to the current moment? Right? Block out everything else. What right. can I do right now? And so if I can just stack moments, right? If I can if I can take care of this moment, which is gonna lead me to this moment, mm -hmm. and yes and and yes and and yes and and what my yes and again has to be based off of something. Well, my yes and is based off of who I am at my best. Right. The guy or the gal that's not familiar with your company, we're talking about an, a company that was built on this concept. The book that you wrote that came out in 2016, Living Yes And, um, I want you to talk to them for just a little bit about your book and about the company, because there really are two types of people on the planet, right? There are those no but people, and then there are the yes and <laughs> people. And I really think some that are listening right now are the no but people, but they want to become a yes and person. So would you just kind of talk to them about your book, talk to them about your company and talk to them about how they can trans, uh, they can go from the no but caterpillar to the yes and butterfly. <laughs> well, and the great thing is, it's like, you know, teach, teach what you struggle with, right, Jeff? And so right. by, by me, by me having to teach yes and it forces me to be better at yeah. yes and. Because, because like anyone listening who might feel like they're a no butter, like I can slip into that really, really easy. And then I have to, I look really at my too. company and I'm like, I got to be accountable. Right. And so it's a, it's a reminder. Um, but yeah, so my book is called three words for getting unstuck. And I'm sure there's some people here who are feeling stuck. And so uh -huh. three words for getting unstuck and those three words are live yes and. And so the book gets into, you know, some of those ideas, some of those improv principles and how we can apply them to our real life. And, and just a lot of it is sort of my own life stuckness sure. and how and how they helped me get out of them but uh, a funny thing about the story i'll give you the quick version uh jeff but i was at img academy which some people mm -hmm. may know it, it's like a, this great sports academy down in florida yeah athletes all over the world come there to train and try to become college athletes and professional athletes and i was there during a time period and i was working with the under 17 boys national team as a leadership coach i worked with all, all right. the kids on campus as a leadership coach and Again, I love soccer, so anytime I could work with the soccer players, it was great. So I did a session for these U17 players, and in the back of the room was a gentleman that was representing the, the national team, senior All national right. team, and he was in my session, and he came up to me after. He's like, hey, I, and I did an improv session. I did a yes and. <laughs> and. He's like, hey, that session was great. Jurgen Klinsmann, who was the coach of the national team at the time, he would really love that session. Would you fly to Los Angeles what? and do it? do it for the national team, right? This is like 2015, early 2015. And I'm like, wait a second, are you kidding me? Like, you're gonna fly me out to LA, I'm gonna get to wow. speak yeah. to the, the men's national team and do this in front of them. Like, this is like, check it off the list. This is yeah. dream stuff. And he's like, let me get back with you. And a couple of days goes by and he gets back with me. He's like, I'm sorry, the schedule changed, oh. right? We can't use you now, but maybe we can do something in the future. And I was like, oh, okay, I appreciate it. Thanks for, you know. And so I was like bummed, right? So what did I do? I called my manager. I said, hey, um, I'm going to be in a little bit late today. I'm going to go to Starbucks and get some work done there and drown in, you know, drown in some <laughs> caffeine, pity. drown my sorrows in, in some caffeine. And uh, so I went, I went to Starbucks and I was like, am I ever going to get an opportunity to do that cool again? Right? Questions that a lot of us have asked, mm -hmm. right? And this gentleman sits down next to me, Jeff. Never met him before, but I've seen him on campus. He was the parent of a tennis player. And uh -huh. he sits down next to me, unprovoked, and he introduces himself. He's like, hey, I've, I've watched your sessions before. He goes, you're really good. I was like, oh, wow, thank you, appreciate that. And he goes, he goes I know you're not asking for advice, but um, he goes, I don't think you're gonna be here very long because you'll do better off being on your own. And he said, what you need really? to do is write, yeah, like total angel, right? Angel out of nowhere, wow. sits on my shoulder, he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll do better things on your own. He goes, but you know what you need to do? You need to write a book. I was like, okay, well, I wanted to write a book. He goes, you need to write a book. He goes, it doesn't even need to be a good book. But if you're a published author, <laughs> it doesn't even have to be good. Just write no. something. <laughs> He's like, now you are author, speaker, coach. There you and, go. And, and I laughed. I was like, oh yeah. And, and, and so he got, he goes, so those are just my two cents. And he got up and he walked away. And again, I'd been wanting to write a book for a long time. And in that moment, he said, write the book. I opened up my computer and I wrote the introduction. Really? I knew what the book was, right? 
because I didn't have the business yet. Wow. Olivia Sand wasn't the business. I'd been doing these things, but I was mm-hmm. working for IMG. So I'm like, okay, I'm writing the book. And I started writing the introduction that day. Fast forward, I leave IMG for five months later to go off on my own. I start my company, Live Yes And, in 2015. I, I finish the book and publish it in 2016. And, you know, and now I'm just kind of like in that wilderness again of leap in the net will appear, right? I'm in the wilderness yeah. of like, how is this going to work out? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm doing more speaking now. And because of my contacts, different college and pro teams are bringing me in to do some work. And I'm doing my thing. And, you know, finding some success, but super, super slow. Uh-huh. And um, now we're in, we're in, you know, late 2019 and the book's been out for three years and I've been using it. You know, I, I think it's a really good book and I, I've been using it sort of as a calling card. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to send a book to the head coach of the U.S. Men's National, who at that point is Greg Berhalter and had nice. been in the job for a year. Right. So, Jeff, you're an author. You know how often sending a cold uh-huh. copy to someone t- turns into something it the works is usually zero percent zero. of the time zero <laughs> it's wasted shipping costs is yes what it is so that's the argument i'm having in my head when i'm like i should send greg a book and the other voice is saying travis you're wasting five minutes writing that note right. you're wasting a drive to the post office and you're wasting the three dollars and 26 cents right. of media mail to send him that book thank god the other voice in my had said, just do it, Travis, just do All it. Right. So I sat down, wrote the note. Hey, Greg, you know, I worked at IMG. I worked with a few guys on the national team. Would love to talk sometime. Popped it in the mail, sent it, sent it and forgot it. Right. And like a week later, I get a text, you know, on the iPhone where it says maybe, you know, sometimes it says maybe so and so. And it says maybe Greg Berhalter. Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, Greg Berhalter, who's Greg Berhalter? Who's Greg, <laughs> who's Greg Berhalter? Because like it was so out of my mind. Uh-huh. Who's Greg? And I asked my wife. I was like, "Hey, Halster, who's Greg Burhoff?" She's like, "I don't know. You were you've been speaking a lot recently. You give your book away. It was probably some you gave your book to." And I was like, "Yeah, wait a second. No, I know that name. This is how, like, I followed Greg my whole how, life. Right? right. So I, we're the same age. Like, he's you know. So I'm like Greg. Bur- I googled it. I'm like, oh my god, no way. He got my wow. book. I sent it to the soccer house. I didn't even send yeah. it to his home address. Like U.S. Soccer House <laughs> care of Greg Berhalter. Not only did he actually get it, Miracle One, he opened it and Miracle Two, Miracle Two, and then he sends me a text. Thanks, wow. Travis, for the book. I look forward to reading it. And now I'm thinking that's where the story ends, Jeff. Right? Yeah, because right. like that was nice of him to do. I'm dancing around the house because I have his cell phone number. <laughs> I got Greg's cell phone number. Right? And then again. It's done. It's over with. I said, oh, hey, thanks, Greg. You know, would love to talk sometime. Love the team. And I'm I'm thinking it's done. Fast forward two weeks later, same text. Do you have time to chat? Wow. And I'm like, "Uh, yeah, uh, I Yes, I do. Yes. uh, How about later this afternoon? So we get on the phone and I'm like, of course, I'm nervous, but I'm like, hey, how's everything going? He's, you know, super cordial. We're super nice. And I start telling him about myself and he cuts me off. Jeff goes, no, 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 no. You don't need to tell me about yourself. I read your book. Wow. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Like, hey, I know you're super busy. What's up? And he now he just dumps on me. He's like, hey, I've been on the job for a year. Here's the culture I'm trying to create. Uh-huh. After reading your book, seeing your skill set, seeing different things that you can do, would you be interested in coming in and doing some work with the national team? And then he asked the question, what does your year look like? <laughs> what? <laughs> And I'm like, flexible. <laughs> yeah. It <laughs> all so, of a sudden just became very flexible. Very open. And so long story short, he hired me as a, a, a six-month contractor. Um, six months turned into three years, turned yeah. into me going to Qatar for the World Cup, to being a Look part of the team, and, and being like in the coach's room at the table for a three-year experience of, of just living, you know, just the opportunity of a life. All the listeners who don't understand where we are right now in the United States, this is the first time there was ever a men's team that looked like they were going to be able to show up and to perform. And I'm just going to say it. It's a hundred percent. Travis is, uh, (laughs) Travis is the hundred percent. The reason why they did so well. Absolutely. Everyone's saying the same thing, Jeff. You're just saying what everyone's saying. Yes. Yes. And so what I, what I love about, and it was, it was, I mean, I'm just so, you know, again, I'm so grateful 
for that experience. Right. But it wasn't it, was, it wasn't Jeff until I reflected back on it. I was like, when did I decide to write the book? Yeah. I decided to write the book when going and talking to the team five years previously right. di- didn't work out. Yeah. And this gentleman says, you're not going to be here long. You need to write a book. And it's the book that I started writing that morning that I sent to Greg. Wow. Almost four years later. That got me not just 60 minutes with the team. It got me three years with the team. Basically, what I heard you saying is that you had coffee with the prophet Elijah at Starbucks. <laughs> um, he just happened to tell you, write a book because you're going to become super famous and do a whole lot of cool stuff. <laughs> And shameless plug, shameless plug, because guess where he and I met officially to close the deal that I was going to work with the team? Uh-uh, where? Starbucks, right? So the, the story begins and ends in Starbucks, where he gives me a PowerPoint presentation of the culture yeah. that he was trying to create. And, you know, it was, again, like if we, you know, Jeff, you know, I know, like if we try to outline how our experience is going to go. Yeah, right. Right. It'll, it will never do anything. And so, right, when I decided to write the book that morning, it wasn't, hey, five years from now, I'm going to send it to the coach and he's going to hire me. It was like, no, oh, this was the nudge. This was the setback. This was the the little motivation that, that pushed me over that hill that was like, it's time to do that thing yeah. that you've been putting off. It, it's time to take that action that you've been wanting to do, not because I knew how it was going to work out, but because this is what I know I'm supposed to do regardless of how. That is a great way to kind of wrap this thing up. There are some people, Travis, we've already talked about it in this episode that are in the goo right now. Yeah. And they are, there are some that have this dream, but I'm getting up every day and I go to work in this dead end job and I hate it. I wish I could pursue my dream, but honestly, I'm just scared. If I leave what I know to go do what I don't know, what if I fall flat on my face? And I really want you to just, I want you to wrap things up today by just challenging them. I'm going to try to use your words. By the way, I wrote down some amazing quotes today, <laughs> but I want you to challenge the listener who really wants to be unbeatable, how to radically collaborate with reality because yeah. they would love to have a different view. They want to be a butterfly one day, but right now they're a caterpillar and they're in the goo and they don't like it. So can you just challenge them? Can you encourage them a little bit as we wrap this thing up? Yeah, Jeff. So I, again, if if we don't take that next step, unless we know how it's going to work out, we will never take that next step. Absolutely. And so yep. uh, again, we have to know that that, that that who we are and what we're about. What is it that truly inspires us and motivates us and gets us excited to get out of bed in the morning? Because as as you know, as a consultant, Jeff, I, I am unemployed more than I am employed. And <laughs> right. So, right. And so I have to love what I'm doing so much that I'm going to work more days where I don't get paid than when I do get paid because mm-hmm. I'm in pursuit of doing. And even on those days when I'm not getting paid, I'm still enjoy what I'm doing because what I'm doing resonates with my purpose and it resonates with what's most important to me. I could wake up every day and go to a job where I'm miserable and, and still feel a sense of security that right. the paycheck's still coming. But guess what? I'm still not happy. I'm still yeah. not miserable. There's no way for me to go in that scenario where I'm eventually going to probably enjoy myself. Right. So it's that ability. I call it the compass compared to, a, you know, GPS. GPS gives us a turn by turn navigation mm-hmm. of exactly where we're going. But life is not a GPS. Life is a compass. And so if I'm willing to do the scary thing, have some courage, if I'm willing to have courage to do what what resonates in my heart and in my soul and to take a step in that direction. Well, guess what? Even if I don't know where I'm going, if I know what my compass is, my compass is always going to point to my right. true north. Yeah. So my next step is just the next step in that direction. And if I get picked up and tossed and turned and uh-huh. thrown over here and dropped over there right. and set back over here, well, guess what? My compass is still going to point me to my true north. And I just need to keep moving in that direction. And the path is going to be a crazy path. Yeah. It will. It, but it's going to be awesome right. at the same time. And... And if we can embrace that, right, if we can embrace that with with that yes and mindset of yes and now I'm going to do this and now I'm going to do this right. and now I'm going to do this. It's not goo, right? It's not goo if we know what's going to happen. Yeah. And if we know what's going to happen, then it's not it's not going to be difficult enough to transform us. And so, you know, are we about comfort or are we about transformation? 
Yeah, you're talking to me right now because I would rather be on a crazy path that's going in the right direction than the perfect path going in a wrong direction. So, right. man, thank right. you. Yeah, hey, there's some course. people that want to know more about you. Um, we're going to tell people about your book. Um, I'm going to actually give away a copy of your book, a free oh, digital you. copy of your book to one of the people that are listening today. But if people want to find out more about you, if they want to pick up your book, where do they go? What's the best place to find the book? Yeah, uh, on Amazon is the best place. Um, so the book is called Three Words for Getting Unstuck, Live Yes And. Um, and then I, you know, my website is liveyesand.com socials or live yes and so um, pretty easy to find and, and any listener out there i i'm usually quick to respond to people as well. so always happy to do interact and engage with anyone who has any questions yeah travis you are awesome thank you for helping people that are in the goo become unbeatable and end up flying like a butterfly on the other side of it man oh uh, thanks jeff and thanks for this platform thanks for everything that you're doing and in, in helping and yeah it's been great talking to you, buddy. You too. Wow. I wrote down this statement that Travis made. Don't let outcomes distract you. I think I'm guilty. Maybe you are too. Of being so focused on the finish line that we lose track along the way. And really what Travis does is coaching in sports, in business, in life. Just helping people Keep going in the direction of your values and your identity. Keep heading towards his words, the North Star. I hope you were as encouraged from this episode with Travis Thomas as I was. And if you are struggling right now, if you're going through some hardships, man, we have a totally free resource that we want to give you. I created this little motivational video. It's designed to help people in every hardship of life be unbeatable. That motivational video is yours. It's free. All you need to do to find that video is just simply go to unbeatablearmy.com. I am going to go out and get Travis's book. And we want to give away a free digital copy of Travis's book. So somebody listening today who's part of the unbeatable army, this list of people that are connected with this podcast and getting information about us throughout the week, not just when we broadcast, somebody on that list is going to get a free copy of Travis's book. You want to get that book? Just go to unbeatablearmy.com. If you're not following us on social media, why don't you go ahead and sign up and subscribe? If you're not already following us on your favorite podcast platform, why don't you go ahead and subscribe however you're listening right now? But I just want to tell you, for the fans that stay connected with us all week long, you're awesome. And our fan for the week this week is not just a fan. She's a friend of mine, somebody that I've known for many years Bridget, thank you for being so faithful and so connected to us on social media. Bridget, you are our fan of the week. And if you want to know more about Bridget, she's on Instagram, B underscore Bridget on Instagram. Thanks for being with us this episode. See you right back here next week. God bless.